Entry 2. A Night In. My eyes shot open. It couldn't be real. I lied there, frozen in fear. All I wanted to do was sleep. But I was terrified now. Did I really just hear that? I checked my phone. It was almost 6 a.m. I sighed. It was beginning to get light outside at least. It was still pretty dark, but dawn was fast approaching, and my ex-wife would be dropping Julian, my four-year-old son, off in about two hours. I'd take him every Sunday, every Tuesday, and every second Saturday. I wish I could see him every day, but such is life, I guess. My ex-wife, Linda, left me a couple years ago because, apparently, I had become withdrawn. We barely spoke to each other, and I suppose she was right. I had become withdrawn. I was disappearing a lot more often during my sleepless nights and for longer periods of time. I was never up to anything other than being alone, but she probably had her suspicions, so that didn't help. Anyway, I supposed I should just get up. I felt so groggy. I stumbled downstairs again, turning off all the lights, and made myself a cup of coffee. It was freezing. The kitchen window was wide open, so I shut it, and turned the heat on. I put the TV on, and had a quick look at the news headlines. There was nothing interesting, so I started channel flicking. I was about halfway through my coffee, when my stomach started to turn. The kitchen window, I thought. I made double, no, triple sure, that every single door and window was locked last night before I went upstairs to bed. Mental images from the previous night raced through my head. That skipping stone, that drowned woman, that guy's face. It made me shiver just thinking about it. I went back upstairs after drinking my coffee. There was nothing good on TV, as per usual. So, I decided to make sure that the spare room was ready for Jules. I changed the bedding and tidied up a little bit. They would be here soon. I had time for a quick shower and got myself ready. I was feeling a little more alive thanks to the coffee and the shower. Three knocks on the front door startled me just as I walked past it. Hi, son, I said as I swung the door open. Nobody was there. Now, I'm fucking freaking out again. I slammed the door shut, and instantly, three knocks rattled the inside of my head. It sounded like a bowling ball falling down some wooden stairs. I sat with my back to the door. Please, just stop. Just stop. Please. I whispered to myself. Three more knocks. I got to my feet, hesitantly. I unlatched the handle and opened the door slowly. Daddy! Daddy, hi! Hi, Dad! My son said. His sweet little voice was like music to my ears. Jules, come give your dad a hug, wee man! I said, delighted to see his face. I was not so delighted to see the dagger-like stare from Linda. What the hell was she pissed about now? I thought. Come on in. I said to the both of them. Jules, go get your toy box. Mom and Dad need to talk for a minute, Linda said, gesturing to the lounge where a box of Julian's toys were stored. She led me into the kitchen. What the fuck was that all about, Cameron? She snarled at me, getting right in my face. What was what about, Linda? What do you mean? I responded. We were standing, waiting for you at the door. You opened it, then slammed it in our faces. What the fuck are you on, Cameron? Julian was so frightened. You better not be on any fucking drugs, because if you are, this will be the last time that you ever see him. But I swear to fucking God, she yelled. They were at the front door, I thought. I couldn't have been more confused. There was definitely no one there when I opened the door. I don't have time to think about it right now. Just say the right words and get this angry psycho out of your house. Think about it later, I thought. 
This really fucked with my head, though. No, Linda, I'm not on drugs, for Christ's sake. I haven't slept much at all recently. I was just joking with the door thing, like a prank. I mean, I, I guess I look like death warmed up, but that's only because I haven't slept. I'm fine now. I had coffee and a nice long shower. I'm feeling pretty good, I explained. Well, I gently ushered her back into the hallway. Everything's fine, I promise, I added. I gave Jules a shout to come say goodbye to his mom and quickly led her out the front door. When she left, Jules was still playing with his toys. I joined him in the lounge and slumped on the couch. Jules looked so happy playing with his cars and trucks. I put Nickelodeon on the TV for him and I laid down on the couch. I wasn't paying attention to the TV at all. Just the sound of Julian playing was all I could hear. My eyes slowly were getting heavier. Push! Purple car has crashed into monster truck. Get the ambulance. Nina, Nina, Nina. Julian said as he played. Bless that child. Julian continued. Come on, purple car. Let's get you to Gecko's garage. He'll fix you up. My eyes were getting even heavier. I had tunnel vision, and Julian's voice was sounding more like an echo in my hollow head. Nina, Nina, Nina. Oh no, ambulance is stuck. Monster truck is helping ambulance. Give me back my stuff. No, mister. It's mine. Give it back. Dad, he's taking my trucks. I sprung from the couch, completely panicked. Well, wh what happened? I asked my son. Jules was visibly upset, but nothing was out of place. The stretchy man tried to take my monster trucks, Dad, Jules said, more annoyed than fearful. I could feel that lump in my throat return. I felt sick. I was so tired. It's okay, Jules. Well, he's gone now. So, there's nothing to worry about. It was just your imagination, son, I said, while sitting him up on my knee. I don't think he's gone, Dad, Julian whispered, as we both heard two thumps coming from above us. I immediately ran upstairs, but all was quiet. There was nothing at all, nothing out of place, no people or anything else. I checked under every bed in every wardrobe and behind every door. Nothing. I then went back downstairs to get Jules. Hey, we should go out. Go grab a ball and some toys and we can go to the park, I said. Jules then jumped up. Yay, the park! He screamed as he grabbed some trucks and a football. We spent a few hours kicking the ball around and just messing around in the park. We got some lunch, a few sandwiches, and some chips. As we were leaving the cafe, I ran into a friend of my dad's, Big Joe. Some called him Old Joe. Some called him the veteran. I didn't know how old this guy was, but he looked about a hundred when I was younger. Anyway, the reason I was so glad to see him was because if you ever wanted to know anything about Evermore, past or present, he was your guy. He seemed to know everything that had ever happened in that town and all the latest gossip. Joe, I said, it's been a while. How are you, old timer? Cammy, son, you're looking good. I've never been better. My God, is that Jules? You were just a little ankle biter the last time I saw you, wee man, he said. He then ruffled Julian's hair. Julian shied away behind me, peering at Joe with suspicion. Hey, he's getting big now, starting school next year, I said, with a proud look on my face. This is Joe. He's a friend of your grandpa's, I explained to Jules, as he continued to hide behind me. Anyway, Joe, I'm actually glad I ran into you. Something happened last night, up at Avi Lockin. Something so insane that I can't even describe it all right now. But I was wondering 
If I could bend your ear about it, maybe tomorrow, if you have time. Joe's expression then changed. He looked a sight more worried than pleased now. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, okay, Cammy, he stuttered and stumbled over his words. His voice fell to a whisper. Listen, make sure you, you come around tomorrow at my house. As soon as you drop Jules off, come alone as early as possible. Okay, no worries, Joe. I'll be there, I replied, feeling a bit freaked out by his response. He had a serious look of worry on his face, and I was eager to find out what he knew. Joe then hurried away without another word, so Jules and I started down the street. We were originally going to go see a movie, but there wasn't anything good at the cinema, so instead we went to a shop to look for a DVD to buy. We got some popcorn, some snacks, and some juice. We got Toy Story 4 and Pinocchio. Secretly, Pinocchio was partly for me too. It's my favorite Disney movie. Let's have a night in, a couple movies, and some snacks, I said, smiling to Julian as the shop assistant carefully packed our stuff into bags. She smiled at Jules. Oh, Toy Story 4, that's one of my favorites. Have you seen it? She asked. Jules shied away behind my legs again. No, you haven't seen it, have you, son? I answered on his behalf, smiling back. Well, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did, she said, letting out a little laugh at Jules being shy. That'll be 38 pounds and 80 pence, she said. I handed her 40 pounds, and she gave me my change. Thank you very much, she said. Thank you, I replied smiling. As I turned to head out of the exit, I caught sight of her name tag. Hello, my name is Loretta. How may I help you? It read. My head then felt dizzy, and I stumbled a step. Are you okay, sir? She asked as she put an arm out to steady me. Yeah, I I'm fine, I replied. It's just... I looked at her name tag once again. Hello, my name is Lauren. How may I help you? It read. And I shook my head, then stared for a moment in confusion. It's nothing. I'm sorry. I just felt a little bit dizzy there. Thank you for helping me, though, I replied. Jules looked at me slightly worried. I took his little hand, and we walked quickly to the car. When I got inside, I had to think for a few minutes. Did I really imagine that, too? My head was spinning. Flashbacks from the night before were vivid in my mind. When we got back home, it was around 4 o'clock. So Jules had about 3 or 4 more hours until it was bedtime. That was plenty of time to watch both movies, eat snacks, get him bathed and ready for bed. Our night in went without incident. Aside from me almost falling asleep a couple times, we had a fantastic night together, just the two of us. Jules loved the movies and so did I. I got him ready for bed and started reading him a Dr. Seuss book. It was What Was I Scared Of? You know, the one about the trousers with nobody inside them that chases the character around? He was sleeping before I was even halfway through it. But I finished it anyway. I kind of enjoyed it. My big kid side was showing through that night. I felt like I would be able to go to sleep pretty easily. I could barely focus on the book. I was that tired. I went downstairs and got some water before returning to my bedroom. I lie in bed, eyes wide open, praying I would be able to sleep tonight. I checked on Jules on the little camera, and he was out like a light. My eyes once again closing on the brink of sleep. With my body relaxed, finally I switched off. The dreams then took over. It felt like I hadn't slept in weeks. I had a very weird dream. I had got Jules a Stretch Armstrong toy for his birthday and it went wild. It started wrapping its arms around him hundreds of times 
and I couldn't get it off. Eventually, it woke me up. I was in a cold sweat. I checked the time on my phone, 1.22 a.m. It was actually quite depressing seeing that. I really felt like I was going to sleep right through the night. I just lied there, listening to the wind outside. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to move. No less than a minute later, I heard Julian screaming, a blood-curdling scream. I jolted it out of bed and burst into his room. Dan! Dan! Help! He screeched as he sat upright, crying his eyes out. The stretchy man said he was going to take me away! He yelled. My body felt weak. I felt absolutely helpless as he sat there, physically shaking. I put my arm around him. It's okay, son. You can come sleep in my bed. It was just a nightmare, I said, knowing for myself that something more sinister was definitely going on here, but not wanting to admit it. I'm scared, Dad. He's not my friend. I think he's a bad man, Julian said. I looked at him sobbing and tried to comfort him. Okay, son. Well, I'm here now, and I won't let him do anything to you. It was just a bad dream. I said. I carried Julian to my bed. I lie awake for several hours while he eventually slept beside me. I was on high alert. Everything had me on edge. I think I slept for another hour or so, maybe. Then my alarm went off. I had to get Julian ready for the nursery. We had some toast for breakfast. I had coffee and I dropped him off at 7.45 a.m. I love you, son. Have fun today, I said, giving him a kiss on the head. Love you, Dad, he shouted, already turning to run into his classroom. I had to get to Joe's ASAP. I wasn't sure if I was too early, but I figured I would drive by anyway and see if he was up. He did say as soon as I dropped Jules off, so surely he would be waiting for me. I drove around. His house was about halfway down a dead-end street. I drove past his house so I could turn around and park facing the way I would be leaving. As I drove past, I saw a large black transit van with a strange red W on the side. It was parked just outside Joe's house. When I got to the end of the street, I looked in my rearview mirror. I saw a hooded figure come from Joe's house, jump in the van, and speed off. I parked in the newly vacant space on the street. When I got out, I had a good look around. Something was strange about what just happened. Something did not sit well with me about the man in the van. I marched up to the front door and rang the bell. No answer. I rang it again. Still no answer. I tried the handle and the door creaked open. Joe? I said hoping to God that he still lived here. I received no reply. I entered the house. The smell was so overpowering that it made me feel lightheaded. I felt like I was struggling to breathe or even to see. It was petrol, you know, gas. Joe's house smelled like a petrol station. Joe! I screamed as I darted up the stairs. Joe was sitting in the hallway, soaking wet, on a wooden seat with tears in his eyes. Joe, what the fuck is going on? I demanded. He just sat there and whimpered. I'm sorry, son. I'm so sorry. Joe, what? What are you sorry about? What the hell is all this? I yelled concerned. Joe then struck a match. Follow the whispers in the woods. Don't trust anyone, not even the police, Joe said crying. He then held the match to his neck. Joe, wait, don't! I barked at him as his whole body was quickly engulfed in flames. In the blink of an eye, the fire snaked and spread onto the floor like it was chasing me down. I fell backwards down the stairs. Luckily, I was able to get myself out, but... 
I did hurt myself. Badly. I was able to make it to my car to phone emergency services. I picked up the phone. Seven missed calls, the screen read. It rang again, mere seconds after I picked it up. Hello? I said. Hi, is this Mr. Murphy? The worried tone in the woman's voice convinced me that this was not going to be good. Yes, speaking. Uh, who is this? I responded. This is Carolyn from Everymore Early Years Daycare and Nursery. You better come down here right away, sir. Your son, Julian, is missing. The police are on their way, and so is his mother, she said. I almost choked. It's a phone call that no parent ever wants to get, and you never expect it until it happens to you. I felt like someone had just ripped every organ out of my entire body. I began shaking uncontrollably. What happened? I mean, what? What's happening? I tried to get my words out, but I could barely speak. Sir, if you could get here right away, please. We can go through the whole protocol with everyone. I'm sure he'll turn up, but we need both of you here as soon as possible, sir, she said. I hung up the phone, jumped in my car, and fucking started bombing it down the road, back to the nursery. I had only left him half an hour ago. This didn't make any sense. I didn't even think about it. Joe's place burning to the ground. Surely someone would phone it in. What if they saw me speeding away from the scene? All of these things rattled around in my mind. I couldn't even think straight. But my train of thought was well and truly stopped, dead in its tracks, just as I approached Julian's nursery. I parked about halfway down the street because I saw something that made my heart stop. Linda's car, three police cars, and a large black transit van with a strange red W on the side parked amongst them.